Welcome everyone to our webinar on ATO compliance, what directors and businesses need to know. My name is Thomas Lenane and I'm a lawyer in Legal Vision's tax and corporate team. I'm joined today by my co-host, Julia Cremona, who is a senior lawyer in our disputes and resolution team. Before we begin, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. So you'll receive the recording and the slides of this webinar on uh, to your email after the presentation. Please submit your questions in the chat box throughout the webinar and we'll answer them at the end. And also please complete the feedback survey that pops up after the webinar. For the next 48 hours, you are eligible for a free consultation with Legal Vision to discuss how we can help your business. To claim this consultation, please provide your contact details in the survey at the end of the webinar. So today we'll be discussing the following. So some current trends and the ATO's focus areas when it comes to their debt recovery actions, what director penalty notices are and how to respond to them if you do receive one, uh, how the ATO is enforcing its debt recovery practices at the moment, some strategies that directors and businesses can take to mitigate uh, ATO uh, debt recovery action, and finishing up with the summary of expectations for the ATO's compliance action moving forward and finishing up with the Q&A. So we'll start with the current trends and the ATO focus areas that we're currently seeing, but just a bit of background. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the ATO did temporarily pause its debt recovery efforts, which was very similar to how they responded to their debt recovery approach during the global financial crisis. And in both situations, this was to support taxpayers through the unprecedented times by allowing them to try and keep their businesses running without having to worry about debt recovery action from the ATO. However, since the pandemic is now over, the ATO is now ramping up its enforcement action to address these outstanding debts. And this return to debt recovery action is again, very similar to how the ATO responded following the end of the global financial crisis. And notably following uh, the end of the GFC and the ATO's debt recovery action during that time, there was a significant increase in the number of companies that were placed into liquidation, which we'll speak to in a bit more detail later. So the state of play at the moment is that there's approximately $50 billion in undisputed and unpaid tax debt, with small businesses accounting for around 65% of this amount. So the ATO is currently seeking to use the tools at its disposal and in its arsenal to recover these amounts from taxpayers. And the ATO is cracking down on lodgement obligations for businesses, but specifically those that relate to employment tax obligations. So things like pay as you go withholding, superannuation and fringe benefits tax. And the rationale is that these obligations and in particular superannuation, they go directly towards an employee's retirement. So the ATO has adopted a strong policy of making sure these amounts in particular are being paid. And beyond you know, employees' retirement, there are, of course, the general policy objectives of taxation, being that the money paid in taxes will ultimately be used by the government for the benefit of the wider population. So this means that the ATO could see that the $50 billion could be money that's be, that could be spent on essential services, such as healthcare and education. And while those amounts go unrecovered, they're amounts that can't be used by the government for those purposes. So beyond small businesses, the ATO is also focusing on recovering amounts from individual taxpayers and their historical tax debts. And I think everyone would remember the very controversial campaign that happened at the end of last year, where the ATO sent out letters to a lot of individual taxpayers around their historical debts. So those are just some of the things that we're seeing at the moment when it comes to the ATO's recovery actions. Uh, but moving on, we'll talk about uh, direct penalty notices because uh, we're currently seeing that the ATO is increasingly using these direct penalty notices as a primary enforcement tool to recover debts from company taxpayers. And so what a direct penalty notice is, or DPN for short, is it's essentially a notice that the ATO can issue to a director of a company where that company has overdue federal tax debts. And so the effect of a DPN is that the director becomes personally liable to pay those overdue debts if the company doesn't. And so the ATO can issue a director penalty notice where there's unpaid pays you go withholding amounts, superannuation and goods and services tax that the company has not paid within certain periods of time. 
When it comes to a director penalty notice, there are two types that a director might receive, being a lockdown DPN or a non-lockdown DPN. And uh, the difference between the two is that a non-lockdown DPN will usually be issued where the company has lodged the relevant tax returns, but has not paid the tax debts on time. And so for pays to go withholding amounts in goods and services tax, that time is three months from the lodgement due date. And for superannuation, the due date of the superannuation guarantee charge statement. And so on the flip side, the lockdown DPN will usually be issued if the company has failed to lodge the relevant returns or the statements within the three-month period from their due date. So the big difference there is whether or not the lodgements have been submitted or not. And so what the effect of receiving one versus the other is that the option that a director has to get the DPN remitted uh, or cancelled essentially is different depending on the type of director penalty notice that you receive. And essentially lockdown DPNs can only be remitted uh, by the debt being paid in full, whether that's by the company or by the director. Uh, whereas a non-lockdown DPN have some other alternatives to the company and to the directors of that company that can be utilised to remit that director penalty notice. Uh, but Julia will discuss those in a little bit more detail further in the webinar. So regardless of the type of DPN that a director receives, it's important that they do act quickly because a director only has 21 days to respond to the director penalty notice. So it's important that action is taken quickly. And then a practical tip that directors need to be aware of is the lodgement dates for the company that they are acting as a director for, because when it comes to director penalty notices, even if taxes aren't paid on time, lodging on time would be very important because this could be the difference between receiving a, a, a lockdown DPN versus a non-lockdown DPN. And then by extension, that would significantly impact the actions that di a director could take to try and remit that DPN, which I think is a very good segue into responding to director penalty notices. So I'll hand over to Julia, who's going to talk a little bit more detail about that. Thanks, Thomas. Um, so like Thomas said, th there are certainly options in responding to director penalty notices. Um, and those options vary um, between whether it's a lockdown or non-lockdown director penalty notice, with obviously more options being available if it is a non-lockdown version. Um, but before going into those options, I just wanted to touch upon um, one point and, and a strategy that we have seen um, quite often come up is that business owners try to explore um, whether they can deregister a company when they're issued or when directors are issued with a director penalty notice. Um, the important thing here to remember is that unfortunately the deregistration doesn't remove a tax debt. So if a company is deregistered, we've seen the ATO go after them and issue director penalty notices um, to the directors of that deregistered company. Um, and that might be in situations where, for example, uh, ASIC has already initiated and, and followed through with a strike off application. Um, so that's just something to remember when receiving a director penalty notices. Um, but other than that, there are certainly options uh, that directors have to respond to, to a director penalty notice. Um, the first one is to either make payment in full of the debt, if this is financially possible for the company uh, or for the director or directors personally. A lot of the time we understand that this isn't an option. Um, so another option is also to try and negotiate a payment plan with the ATO. And so this could be, for example, uh, payments made sporadically over a period of time um, that pays out the full debt. Or in some cases, you might be able to negotiate to pay a, a reduced amount of the debt. Um, but generally speaking, what you need to do is to prove to the ATO with some certainty your ability to comply with this sort of payment plan. The type of things that the ATO looks at when considering a payment plan and whether to accept it um, largely relate to why you can't pay the debt by the due date. Um, it depends on the type of evidence that you submit with your payment plan. So things like uh, your bank details, including your current account balances, uh, any lines of credit that you have, being the company and you personally as a director, um, any income that the company is receiving, as well as um, a director is personally receiving, things like uh, evidence of assets and expenses. The other things the ATO looks at as well is um, whether the company and the directors have taken reasonable steps to mitigate the effect of those circumstances, um, 
that has have led to them not being able to comply or, or pay their tax liabilities. Um, whether a company or, or a director personally has defaulted on or cancelled two or more payment plans in the last 12 months. Um, another thing that they look at is whether a director of a com or a company have received any warning letters or, there's, or if there's been any court action commenced against the company or against the directors. Um, a very important thing is how communicative and how cooperative directors have been with the ATO to date. Obviously, the ATO uh, generally doesn't look favourably upon people that simply just, um, you know, don't respond or, or try to evade um, the ATO's uh, communication. And sometimes also the ATO considers accepting security over the debt, um, where you, for example, request time to defer payment or, or seek to pay by instalments. Uh, the ATO usually prefers securities such as a registered mortgage over freehold property um, and things like uh, unconditional bank guarantees from an Australian bank. So it's important to remember that even if um, a director is negotiating a payment plan with the ATO, the ATO can still offset uh, personal credits and refunds against that debt. Um, and keep in mind that this is in addition to any payment plan that's agreed by the ATO. So it won't replace um, the payment plan payments as well. Uh, there are also interest-free plans available uh, and they have strict eligibility criteria. Um, and you can certainly look into those further with an accountant, financial advisor um, or legal advisor as well. Um, the other important thing for, for payment plans is to remember that it doesn't cause the director penalty notice to go away, uh, but what it does is it puts the DPN on hold or essentially on pause while the company is servicing the payment plan. Um, however, importantly, uh, interest will usually continue to accrue on that debt, even if there is a payment plan in place. So that's something very important to remember. And that's why it's always better to try and pay as much of a lump sum as possible uh, and to pay off the debt as quickly as possible, um, and if, if that is financially viable. Uh, in circumstances where the debt is $200,000 or less, um, the ATO allows companies and individuals to set up a payment plan online or use the self-help phone line um, to try and set that up. Um, the ATO also provides an online payment estimator to help calculate a payment plan that um, a company and a director can afford. Uh, it also helps uh, to work out how quickly and efficiently you can pay off a tax debt uh, and how much interest you'll be charged. Uh, so essentially, like I said, the, the longer it takes for you to pay off your, the debt, the more interest you'll pay. Uh, apart from a payment plan or paying the debt in full, uh, other options to respond to a director penalty notice include having a liquidator appointed to wind up the company. Uh, here it's important to note that liquidation does remove the tax debt and DPN obligations if there are no late lodgements. So that's something important to consider. Other options also include appointing an administrator to the company, uh, appointing a small business restructuring practitioner, or proving a defence to the director penalty notice. The important thing to remember here is when responding to a director penalty notice, if it is a non-lockdown one, uh, like Thomas said, you only have 21 days from the date of the notice to action any of these items. So a question that comes up a lot is the type of defences that are available to director penalty notices. Um, these include, uh, one, that a director did not take part and it would have been unreasonable to expect the director to take part in the management of the company during the relevant period because of an illness or other acceptable reason. Uh, secondly, is that a director took all reasonable steps unless there were no reasonable steps available uh, to ensure that one of the following things happened, that the company paid the outstanding debt that an administrator was appointed to the company, that a small business restructuring practitioner was appointed, or the directors began winding up the company. Um, and thirdly, in the case of an unpaid superannuation guarantee charge liability, um, there is a defence that the company treated uh, the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act as applying in a way that could be reasonably argued was in accordance with the law, and that the company took reasonable care in applying that act. So in relation to these defences, the courts have held that they must be proved for the entire period that the director was under the obligation. 
And courts have also ruled that as a director, it is not a defence uh, if you've relied on other people to ensure the obligations were met. So that includes if you're relying on fellow directors um, and professional advisors as well. That's certainly not seen by the courts um, as an excuse for a defence. Uh, if, as a director, um, a director or more directors are looking at uh, submitting a defence to the ATO within the time frame, um, it needs to be submit, submitted to the ATO in writing. It needs to clearly articulate what defence the director or directors are seeking to rely on. Uh, it should also provide all necessary information and supporting documents to substantiate the defence. So many of the evidences that we referred to as well um, in the payment plan section. That's usually submitted uh, through the ATO portal or mailed to the ATO as well. So when you do have a lockdown DPN, um, apart from a non-lockdown DPN, the main option to avoid personal liability as a director uh, is really for the company to pay the debt um, or, or to consider one of these defences. So looking at the powers the ATO then has after they've issued a director penalty notice, um, the ATO has powers to commence or, or recommence recovery action um, from each director personally, if there's more than one. Uh, it's important to remember that the liability under director penalty notices is a parallel liability, which means that this allows the commissioner to pursue either the company or one or more of the directors in relation to those liabilities. The ATO usually uses firmer action um, like enforcing the director penalty notices when people have been seen to be unwilling to work with the ATO, where they repeatedly default on agreed payment plans. Um, if they don't have the capacity to pay and don't take steps to resolve the situation, where they've been subject to an audit where the ATO might have detected deliberate avoidance and that payment avoidance continues, um, and when it appears that the directors and the company are engaging in phoenixing, phoenixing activities. And this essentially means where um, the company and the directors use liquidation to avoid their financial obligations uh, with the intention of then resuming business operations through a new entity. Now, one of the main options that the ATO uses to try and enforce these director penalty notices are garnishee notices. So this allows the ATO to issue a notice to a third party that holds money for a director or may hold money for a director in the future. So that notice requires that third party to pay money directly to the ATO to reduce the debt. Um, a copy of the garnishee notice is usually issued to the director at the same time that it's issued to that third party. And they're usually issued to people like a director's employer or contractor, um, banks, financial institutions and building societies where a director has accounts or people that owe a director money. For example, if a director is owed money from the sale of real estate, a garnishee order might go to purchases, real estate agents and solicitors. Another option that the ATO looks at when enforcing a director penalty notice is offsetting any of the tax credits against director penalties. And I touched on this a bit earlier before. Uh, this will usually come up in your running statement of account that's available to your accountant as well. Another option that the ATO looks at in terms of enforcing uh, these debts is to disclose the debt to a credit reporting bureau. Uh, the ATO usually does this with respect to debts that are over $100,000. Uh, the process usually is that the ATO first sends a notice of intent to disclose that advises a director of the relevant action to take. Uh, if the ATO does go ahead and report to credit reporting bureaus, uh, the consequence of that, unfortunately, is that it can adversely affect a director's credit rating uh, and limit their ability to borrow money. Uh, if you are, as a director, already engaged with the ATO to manage a tax debt, the debts would unlikely be reported to a credit reporting bureau. Another option uh, that we've seen come up uh, quite often this year uh, is the use of an external debt collection agency. So from January this year, the ATO has actually engaged uh, an external debt collection agency called Recoveries Corp to assist with their debt collection. Um, what this usually involves is the debt recovery agency contacting a director by phone call, email, SMS or letter and demanding payment of the outstanding de debt. If there is a registered tax, tax professional on record, um, the agency might also contact them as well. 
And last but not least is the ATO might uh, initiate legal proceedings to, to recover the debt against a director personally. Uh, the ATO usually takes this action in, circumstance, in circumstances where there is a large debt um, and when a, a director is unwilling to work with the ATO where they've defaulted on payment plans um, or where they've done any activities or the ATO suspects any activities that might be deliberate avoidance or phoenix. Now, it's important to remember that the court process can be an expensive and time-consuming time process uh, and it also has other negative ramifications for directors if a judgment is made against them. So among other things, if a judgment is made, it's usually reported to credit reporting bureaus, which can again impact your credit rating and ability to, to obtain finance moving forward. In addition to that, um, once a judgment is made, the ATO then can then take steps to enforce the judgment through the court system in a number of ways. When doing so, the ATO will also usually add interest and legal costs to that judgment debt. So in order to enforce a judgment debt, the ATO can seek orders to do things like seizing personal property belonging to you, again, a garnishee order through the courts, uh, a charging order where they can secure a charge over certain personal property, uh, a debtor examination, um, and mainly bankruptcy proceedings, which we see them use quite often. So if the judgment debt is for more than $10,000, the ATO can take steps to make a director bankrupt. So what this usually involves is the ATO issuing the director with a bankruptcy notice in the first instance. This gives the director another 21 days from the service of that notice to comply with the bankruptcy notice, essentially pay the outstanding amount, or apply to the court to set aside the bankruptcy notice or extend the time to comply with it. Uh, if a director fails to comply with a bankruptcy notice, uh, that in, then entitles the ATO to file a creditor's petition seeking to make a director bankrupt. Again, this enforcement process is through the courts and it is, again, an expensive and time-consuming one. Um, so when a person does become bankrupt, a director does become bankrupt, uh, what happens is a trustee takes possession of nearly all of the assets of the director and then sells them to try and pay the debts, the debt owing to the ATO. Uh, generally speaking, the ATO won't seek to make a director bankrupt if it is clear that they're able to pay the debt in a reasonable time. Uh, but if a director is facing bankruptcy action and believes that they can pay their debts, it's always a good idea to provide the ATO with clear evidence of their ability to pay. I might pass on to Thomas now to discuss some mitigation strategies uh, when dealing with the ATO's enforcement actions. Great, thanks, Julia. So when it comes to the mitigation strategies for an incoming director, the best thing an incoming director could do to mitigate the circumstances that we've seen throughout the webinar is to do their due diligence over the company that they're about to become a director of. So leave no stone unturned to find out what the tax position of the company is before consenting to act as a director. Uh, and it's really irrelevant that they weren't uh, appointed as a director when the company had failed to lodge or failed to pay on time, because the general rule is that you essentially have a 30-day window where if there was an outstanding debt uh, at the time that you're appointed, and if it remains outstanding within 30 days, then that's where the ATO can also issue that director, a director penalty notice for that outstanding tax debt of the company. So the key questions that a director should be asking before they consent to act as a director are things around employees and contractors, you know, with particular, uh, in particular for contractors, has advice ever been received by the company as to whether those contractors have been cla uh, classified correctly as genuine contractors for tax purposes, or if they are employees for tax purposes and therefore are owed superannuation, uh, and then there's pay-to-go withholding obligations as well. And in that latter case, have those relevant employment tax obligations been complied with by the company? Because if not, that's where there might be you know, unpaid liabilities where that can lead to a director penalty notice. And of course, you know, the same obligations for you know, actual employees as well, making sure that superannuation has been paid on time and the pay to go withholding has been remitted as required. 
uh, when it comes to goods and services tax, of course, uh, making sure that the company's business activity statements uh, are up to date and lodged on time, you know, in a perfect world as well, uh, that the actual payments of those tax obligations have been made as well, but at the very least have the lodgements been made when they were required to be made. And so another important point to remember for a director is that uh, DPNs can be issued over former directors who are no longer acting as a director of that company if the relevant tax liability arose when they were acting as a director and it still remains unpaid. And it's usually not open to a director to negotiate, uh, sorry, a former director to negotiate with the current directors to try and negotiate their way out of that director penalty notice because as Julia mentioned earlier, these uh, these recovery actions can all happen simultaneously and the ATO can go after multiple directors at the same time, including those former directors and the DPNs are personal to that director and can't be negotiated with the other directors. So once a director is acting as a director you know, on the board of a company, what they should be doing is working with the company's management team and other directors to make sure that the internal and external financial practices of that company are set up in a way to ensure that the company can comply with its tax obligations. So things like are systems in place to ensure that lodgements can be made on time and you know, again, in a perfect world, that the tax liabilities can be paid on time as well. So the directors should be working with uh, their tax advisors, so people like accountants, financial advisors, and in certain circumstances, their lawyers too, uh, who can assist with things like lodgements of statements and returns, and also other considerations and obligations like payroll for their employees. So in particular with payroll and superannuation, making sure that those payments are being made on time to the employee's nominated fund. So at the moment, uh, an employer has 28 days from the end of the quarter to make the superannuation guarantee payments, otherwise they will be late. But what the ATO looks at is not when the amount is actually paid, but when it's received by the fund. And you know, in particular things like if you know, a payment is made just before a weekend or a long weekend even, or a public holiday, or even if the uh, if the employer uses the superannuation clearinghouse as well, there can just be time added between the date that the payment is made and the date that the fund is receiving that money. So processes should be set up internally to make sure that everything is happening before the due date to make sure that there are no late payments. And by virtue of that, there's going to be no liability for the superannuation guarantee charge, which is when the ATO can issue a direct penalty notice. So if a company unfortunately does start to fall behind on its tax obligations, it should really be seeking, the director should be seeking advice as soon as possible with their accountants and their lawyers so that planning can be made around strategy uh, and then starting to work with the ATO to start being able to make payments to get that tax debt sorted out and paid. So as Julia mentioned, the ATO looks quite favorably at taxpayers who engage with them early. So as part of this process, you know, by engaging early with the ATO, they're more likely to accept things like payment plans if the company can't pay the full amount on time, and also um, are less likely to impose extra penalties, including DPNs, as if the taxpayers are willing to engage with the ATO early. So as Julia mentioned as well, the DPNs have very limited defences and as we've seen, the tribunals and the courts have been very strict in their application. So in these times, it's, it's usually not enough to say that the COVID-19 pandemic was the reason why the lodgements weren't able to be made on time. Also illness of a director or illness of an accountant usually by itself is not enough to show or to prove the defence. What the directors usually have to do is prove why those circumstances led to the company not being able to lodge those, those statements or those returns on time. And so, you know, by setting up these internal processes, uh, you would hope that there would be no circumstances that lead to a defence ever having to actually be used. So those are strategies that the directors can take to avoid having to use those defences in the future. And then finally, a more practical tip when it comes to 
mitigation strategies is directors should ensure that their residential addresses are up to date across any relevant regulatory register. So the big one is making sure that the director's addresses are up to date on the ASIC register, because that is what the ATO is going to use to send the director penalty notice to the director. You know, they also might send it to a tax advisor if uh, the director has one appointed, but in the absence of that, the ASIC address, uh, the address listed on ASIC is what the ATO will use. And it's not a defense that the director never received the DPN because their address was incorrect on the ASIC register. Uh, and in all of this, if the director receives the DPN late uh, or only with a few days before the 21 day window is up, that's of course gonna significantly impact the amount of time the director has to prepare a response to that director penalty notice. So as we would have seen throughout this entire presentation, you know, a big thing that a director and a company needs to do is really be proactive to try and keep on top of the company's tax obligations uh, and in doing so maintaining a good relationship with the ATO is going to go a long way because if the company is unfortunately in a position where it can't pay its taxes on time, having that relationship with the ATO is going to make them more likely to enter into a payment plan with the company. And then, you know, if you do receive a direct penalty notice, it's really important that you do get advice as soon as possible uh, and really as early as you can because there is that 21 day window to prepare a response and send it to the ATO. Uh, and as Julia mentioned, if you do fail to take action within that 21 day period, then there are other steps that the ATO can take, including commencing proceedings and which could even lead to them filing a creditor's petition to bankrupt the director. So it is really important that a director doesn't bury their heads in the sand when it comes to these notices and they get advice as soon as possible. Uh, but that's it from me. I'll pass back to Julia, who will wrap up with a summary of what we can expect from the ATO in the future. Thanks, Thomas. So in terms of what we've been seeing and what the ATO has um, been disclosing in terms of what we can expect to happen, uh, the main three things that we've identified is, one, we can expect an increase in the ATO issuing director penalty notices. Um, they've already issued them a lot uh, but, but there's certainly a, an expectation that this will also increase. They're taking more aggressive debt collection efforts uh, and there will also be a higher number of wind-ups as a result. Um, secondly, there's also been many reports since as early as, as late last year uh, that the ATO is becoming more stringent about payment plans as well. There seems to be a higher uh, burden on taxpayers and directors in this case to provide more evidence and substantiate any payment plans that they're proposing to the ATO. Um, and, and like I mentioned, and like Thomas mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, uh, there'll be higher insolvency levels uh, similar to the post-global financial crisis trends. So that concludes the main part of our webinar. Uh, you might find our Director Duties Guide useful. You can download a copy of this by scanning the QR code on the screen and downloading it in the handout panel. We also have an upcoming event that you might be interested in called Maximising Small Business Growth for the New Financial Year. It's taking place on the 4th of July at 11am. You can register now uh, at the link on the screen. So we're going to answer your questions very shortly, but while you submit the rest of them, uh, we'll take a minute to tell you about Legal Vision's membership. So by becoming a Legal Vision member, your business gets unlimited access to our full team of 100 plus specialist lawyers for all of your business as usual legal needs. If you like having your own in-house counsel for a fraction of the cost, our team can assist you with things like unlimited document drafting and reviewing business contracts, unlimited legal advice consultations, unlimited domestic trademark registration, and much more. Uh, and there are options to purchase extra credits towards complex matters and ongoing disputes, uh, which are charged on an hourly rates basis. We also offer a dedicated service for in-house teams and general counsel to manage high volume business as usual legal tasks. If you'd like to learn more about the Legal Vision membership and how it can help you and your business, uh, you can request a free consultation when the survey appears at the end of this webinar.
So now we're going to take some time to answer some of your questions and we can see that we've gotten a few questions during the webinar as well, which are quite interesting and would be interesting to talk about. I might just get started uh, with one that we got a bit early on in the webinar uh, in relation to uh, the option to appoint liquidators to wind up a company in response to a director penalty notice. Uh, the question states, uh, is it correct that this option is only available if the notice was issued to the company and that the ATO can issue an individual notice to the directors regardless of, of the company being wound up? Now, the, the director penalty notice is just to clarify, are issued to directors personally. Director penalty notices aren't issued to a company. So in response to that notice being issued to a director personally, if you are looking at uh, getting out of personal liability, uh, liquidating the company is one of those options. Uh, and like we mentioned in the webinar, uh, what it does do is it, it is it does away with the director penalty notice and the personal liability only if the lodgements for the company are up to date. That's an important thing to remember. Um, the, uh, this question has been asked a few times, so I'll just answer all of the <laughs> all of the questions at once around uh, basically whether or not a director who's just been appointed will be liable for the historical tax obligations of the company and we did cover this in the webinar but you know just to reiterate that an incoming director if you know obviously should be doing their due diligence before they come on board but if uh, they don't find everything there still is a an essentially there's a 30-day grace period after being appointed as a director where a director can resign within that 30-day period and not be liable uh, to receive a director penalty notice but if essentially if there's an unpaid tax liability of the company at the time the director is appointed and it goes unpaid for 30 days, that's where it's open to the ATO to uh, issue a director penalty notice to that incoming director. So that's why incoming directors should be super aware of the tax position of the company before they act or consent to act, because if that 30 day window is up, it's not really relevant whether or not you were around at the time the debt, the debt was incurred or the lodgement wasn't submitted on time. And just why, while I'm while I'm going, while I'm here, um, it's uh, some people have asked again around uh, how um, you classify a worker as a contractor versus an employee. Uh, and, you know, that's a webinar in and of itself. And in fact, we actually did do a webinar about this previously. So if you're interested, it'll be on Legal Vision's uh, YouTube channel. But uh, essentially, you know, it's, it's a big question and it really looks to the arrangement between the contractor and the company. And in a nutshell, whether or not that relationship looks more like an employment, a traditional employment relationship versus one of a genuine contractor. So factors such as, you know, the control the company has over the worker, over how and when they do the work, whether the worker can delegate, whether it's a results-based arrangement, those are just some of the factors. For superannuation specifically, there is an extended meaning of the term employee for superannuation purposes, which can capture a lot of contractors. And it's usually where the arrangement is for you know, the labour or the time of the person uh, where they have to do the work personally and they aren't paid to achieve a particular result. So in that case, you know, that's where an employee, oh, sorry, a contractor can be considered an employee specifically for superannuation purposes. So we definitely recommend getting advice on the distinction because it is um, quite a contentious area subject to a lot of cases and a lot of ATO rulings and whatnot. And especially because the ATO has such a big focus area on employment taxes at the moment, it's important to get advice because ultimately pays you go withholding and superannuation uh, guarantee charge amounts are amounts that can be subject to a DPN. So some of the other ones coming through. So there's been a question around um, due diligence and getting an understanding of the tax position of the other directors. Um, so, I mean, when it comes to this, as Julia and I have mentioned, you know, a direct penalty notice is personal to a particular director and the ATO can issue them all, all of the directors in parallel with direct penalty notices and can choose, you know, if the company doesn't pay its debts, 
uh, who it enforces over. So, I mean, there's no hard and fast rule on what you do due diligence over um, and whether or not you want to include the other director's tax position as part of that, whether or not they're going to give you that information, I guess, depends on the particular person. Uh, but just noting again, you know, from a practical perspective, uh, potentially if the ATO is less convinced the one director is able to pay, then maybe they would in practice go after an, another director who can. I guess we can't say for sure, but I guess there's no hard and fast rule when it comes to what due diligence you are doing. Okay. There's also been a question um, in relation to whether the obligations also apply to a company secretary. Now, generally speaking, this applies to directors, um, the directors at the time that the liability arose, so whether current or, or past directors. The other thing to remember is it could potentially, potentially apply to what we call shadow directors, so people that aren't directors on the record on ASIC, but essentially act as directors of the company in, in, in its day-to-day -day management. Now, this is, of course, it does, of course, require um, some evidence to prove that that is the case, but there is a risk that people that aren't listed specifically as directors uh, can become liable uh, and can receive director penalty notices. Um, so there's a question uh, around, you know, whether or not a particular bookkeeper should report their client to you know, around, you know, some potentially failed obligations um, and what that might mean. I mean, I think that question is a little bit beyond the scope of this webinar. And if you do want to chat to us, I, I suggest you get in touch. But when it comes to your you know, ethical and professional obligations as a registered BAS agent, I mean, it might be worthwhile maybe having a chat in first instance to the tax practitioners board who might be able to give you some high level guidance on what your obligations might be. Uh, but from there, you know, if you do want to explore that in further detail, definitely recommend filling out the questionnaire at the end around the consultation. Uh, and if we are able to assist after that initial scoping call with you, we'll, we'll let you know from there. There are, there are a lot of very good questions here. So Thomas and I are just sifting through them. Um, so there is a question around uh, if a company with a large tax debt is sold, does the tax liability transfer to the new owner? So at a, at a very high level, yes. Uh, in a share sale where the entire company is being sold, then every uh, outstanding liability including tax debts, does transfer to the new owners. Um, and as part of that, if new directors are appointed, you know, what we've spoken about before around the 30-day grace period would apply here. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the previous directors are off the hook. You know, as we've said, previous directors can still be, uh, can receive director penalty notices for those liabilities if they were directors at the time that they were incurred. Uh, but yes, um, basically any liability, including the tax liabilities, do go to the new owners in a share sale. We've got another question here um, that says, if a director resigns when the company is in good standing and has taken all steps to ensure compliance and payment of all liabilities, uh, can they still be held liable after resignation? And I think this sort of follows through from the last question as well. Um, so similarly, uh, you know, if you are an ex-director, you might be liable for a director penalty notice or might receive one. Um, in terms of the points about uh, taking all steps to ensure compliance, compliance and payment of all liabilities, if that's the case, there'll be nothing outstanding. But if for some reason uh, during a director's time there was a liability incurred and it is outstanding, um, then there might be a DPN issued. Uh, the important thing is if you do have evidence that you've taken steps to ensure compliance and you've done what you reasonably can, that can be used in your discussions with the ATO or potentially um, to negotiate a payment plan of some sort. Um, so there's been a question, I think, following on from the share sale one around what if it's an asset sale? So usually with an asset sale, you know, at a very high level, because the assets of the business are being sold from one entity to another, generally the liabilities stay with the previous entity because it is a completely separate entity and by virtue of that a separate taxpayer so the the tax debts usually would stay with the previous entity but in saying that again you know if there's been overlap in directorship 
you know, if the directors have resigned of that previous business, et cetera, et cetera, you're not going to be off the hook just because the business has been sold. You know, if there's previous liabilities, tax liabilities, and you were director at that time, the ATO can still come after you. So I think that's all the time that we have for today. I'm very sorry if we haven't been able to answer your questions, uh, but if we haven't been able to get to your questions today, please do submit your details at the survey that will pop up at the end uh, where we can go through your questions and also talk you through how our membership might be able to assist you. Uh, while this is a free webinar, we do appreciate any feedback that you might have. So please also complete the 30 second survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.